Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bible Church. It's good to see everybody here. If you're visiting with us, uh, please fill out a vis visitation card in either foyer and let us know who you are. And if you have a prayer need, write it down. The elders meet on Tuesdays and we'll, we'll pray for you. We, we may not meet this Tuesday since Doug is in the hospital and Ray and has got strep throat and um, that leaves me. No. Well, maybe Tim. And welcome back, Tim. It's a pleasure to see you again, brother. And Vanessa, I appreciate your hard work uh, as you are obedient to the Lord. And I hope you all enjoyed your vacation and everything. <laughs> I think it might have been a little bit of a trying vacation, but putting up with me is a little bit trying, too. Um, announcements are in the foyer. They are uh, still a need for the Hill Country Pregnancy Care Center to have clothes for babies to toddlers. Any questions, you can call Becky Hass. And then uh, not to forget for the singles and the, um, the widowed, our widowers, there's the bingo next, uh, next Saturday, right? Oh, I'm sorry, this Saturday at the end of the week. Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, don't don't forget um, they have a big time there. They give away some, you know, top top gifts like ten thousand thank yous. And then there's a new class, drawing from the well. Uh, Esther's going to be doing that in uh, Wayne Thrasher's old classroom. And um, there is a book involved. If you need the book. You can't afford it. Just mention that to one of the elders, Tim or myself or anybody else, and we will take care of it. Do not let that be an obstacle in this education. And Esther's a former teacher, so you better be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she won't put up with you. Uh, as you can see, your joyful giving is going to have a little impact on you in a minute when Tim shows you some some pictures of uh, what it means to be in the Jesus Network. And a few dollars given here multiplies halfway around the world. And um, it's good to know that this small church has listened to the voice of the Lord and is giving, and, uh, and that gift is planting seeds. And a lot of those seeds are falling on very fertile soil. And there's a lot of people hurting, and they're needing attention, they need money, they need food, they need education. So please don't um, forget to be faithful because God is faithful and he's unchanging and he's always been faithful to us. I'm going to get uh, briefly just remind myself of a conversation I had with a man earlier this morning was talking about his struggles and now he hears these voices in his head. And I said, well, then it's working. Because the spiritual warfare goes on when you give yourself to the Lord. And it reminded me when I was complaining in prayer one time to the Lord about my wife. <laughs> and um, I heard an audible voice saying, I gave you a beautiful woman to love. And it's time for you to start praying for her and stop complaining about her. And I um, I teared up as I heard those words, and I said, you know, if I put the energy into praying for her daily and praying over her as she lay sleeping in the mornings before I wake her, what power might God have for me and for our relationship? And I think at that point, our marriage was completely transformed because we both changed our focus. We realized that all the power belongs to him. And we had a simple way of accessing it. And that's through humble and obedient prayer. And I still do that daily. I set aside time every morning to pray before I go and face the world because I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. 
We celebrate communion here every Sunday for a very good reason. Because the Lord Jesus said, do this often in remembrance of me. And so on that night, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he passed it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given to you. And in the same manner, he took the cup, passing, saying, take and drink. This cup represents the blood. That blood that he shed is what cleanses us in an eternal baptism. The water in a baptism doesn't wash away the sin. It's the blood of the cross. Receive it and it's yours. It's a gift. It's free. And it's out of love. It's born of love and it'll always be love. Would you all pray with me, please? Father, we're just so thankful for your generous provisions and how you love us and care for us. But I just thank you that uh, you have empowered this small church to be a vessel of your love. Sometimes it's only two blocks away and sometimes it's halfway around the world. Uh, I just ask that you to let those seeds that Tim and Vanessa left behind in Sri Lanka, let them grow into a wonderful relationship with you. And now I just ask your hand of peace and power upon Tim as he comes forward, that you would uh, give us ears to hear and a heart to receive what it is you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. So good to be home and to be with all of you, and so grateful for the elders to give me that nice vacation. <laughs> I tell you, there is nothing vacation about a 16 and a half hour flight. Like the first flight was five hours, then it was 16 and a half hours, and then like four hours to wait for the last hour. And you're just like, I need a vacation. <laughs> it's just like, I don't care. It's just like, you're just, I was just like in a fog. All day Friday, I was just like, I was driving and trying to get all caught up, and I was like, I hope I don't get pulled over because there's no way I could walk a straight line. <laughs> it was just exhausting. But um, we had such a great trip. If you want to see a ton of pictures, just go visit um, the Facebook page for American Ed or my personal page. I posted tons and tons of pictures. The only pictures that aren't on there are all of the baptisms because Sri Lanka is still a, a socialist country with uh, anti-conversion laws, and um, I don't want them to um, take my visa away. That happened to us in India, not being quite careful enough. But um, we just it was just an incredible trip. We hadn't been there in a year because of the economic crisis and the inability to get fuel to travel to the projects, but Last year, we were able to complete, I think, somewhere over 50 projects where there were either wells, houses, you know, um, gardening projects, projects so that pastors can have a livelihood. And um, it was just fantastic to see the fruit of it all. Um, our driver, um, <laughs> I, I never drive in Sri Lanka, never have the whole time because... Uh, uh, it's insane, and um, it's always best to, because you're traveling in different areas, uh, to have someone who knows the local environment to protect you. Um, so anyways, our driver, uh, Nilantha, is a Buddhist, and um, he um, had the privilege of spending anywhere between 12 and 14 hours a day in the car with me, and um, he... Uh, <laughs> He started asking me some questions like, okay, well, you know, I'm Buddhist because I was, I was born Buddhist and, uh, you know, um, I know there's like Catholics and then there's other kinds of Christians and what's the difference and, 
you know, there's this and there's that. And he, they were all kind of like innocent questions. And so, you know, we, I just kept talking to him and letting, he'd come back and ask more questions. I said, here it comes down. The main thing, Nalanta, is what's your destination? There's a Buddhist destination and there's an Islamic destination. And if you want to pay the price for your sin and you think that you can such achieve nothingness where you don't exist, it's okay. But only Christ has the solution to sin. Muhammad didn't have a solution to sin. Buddha didn't have a solution to sin. Um, Hindus don't have a solution to sin. Only Jesus had a solution for our sin, which allowed us to be in relationship with God so that we didn't have to go to temples and we could be the temple. So what do you want your destination to be? And we talked some more. And I think about like the fourth day into this, that evening he came to me and he goes, I believe. I'm, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. And so we sat together and just talked about all that it meant to receive Christ. And he said, you know, he goes, man, I, the next day he was just so happy. And he was like, I just feel like a whole new person. And um, I can't remember if it was two or three days later, he came to me and he goes, I want to be baptized. And um, there he is getting baptized. Um, we were at a hotel and uh, we just walked in, baptized, and he goes, he, after I you know, brought him out of the water, he just jumped up in the air and yelled, and he goes, man, I can't believe how happy I am. And uh, I said, uh, you know, you can't believe how happy I am. <laughs> um, it, you know, it never gets old. And I don't know how many families that we had done different projects um, for over the last years who had told us we're believers now and we're a part of this church and because we always partner every area with a church so that you know we can get them discipled and and you know just a thousand stories sitting in the house with a muslim leader who has leprosy that we vanessa and i helped several years ago and now he's um leading the what we, we we set up these like leprosy councils it's not official it's uh somewhere like a support group for them and he had another man that had leprosy and so we came and figured out how we could do a little project to help him survive and here's the deal so you have a country that's buddhist hindu muslim and they don't integrate and he invited the Christian and the Hindu all into his home to celebrate. Um, it's just amazing things. Uh, one day we, were, we worked through the public health department because um, they identify leprosy. And you know, I mean, this is a socialist country and they invited me to speak to this auditorium full of people with leprosy and I shared the whole gospel with all these people and talked about the hope that we have in Christ, how, you know, the big, the big problem that, that, that they face with leprosy, it's, I mean, since biblical days, right, is the stigma associated with leprosy. And I told them that Jesus is the only one who removes the stigma. And it's true of not just leprosy, but everything. And um, it was just like that trip, the whole, the whole trip was just like, Wow, God was just like showing you, man, there's a, there's, this is a beautiful gift, you know. Um, it was exhausting, though. I mean, like, I was like, I'm too old for this. One day I told him at 4 o'clock, I said, take me to the hotel. I'm not doing it. any more projects today. I can't do it. I'm an old man. Leave me alone. Um, but um, the other thing that we... <laughs> The other thing that, that we saw was the, how, like, in the economic crisis, crisis that's going on, and they're having inflation at over 100% per year. And, you know, rich people always have a way of surviving in those circumstances. But the poor people 
they're, they're just so much, I mean, the thing that affected me was all these families with three and four kids, school-age kids, are having to decide which one of their children can go to school. And working with churches and community centers, and they're saying, like, the kids pass out because they haven't eaten. And we walked away, you know, Vanessa and I, there was a leprosy-afflicted family, and the little girl had leprosy and we're, we're sit, can't go to school because they don't have money for shoes. It's not that school fees are real high in Sri Lanka, it's, but you have to have shoes, you have to have a uniform, you have to have books, you have to have pencils, you have to have, you know, the, some basic things, and it's not a lot of money. Um, we figured out like 70 $75 we could outfit a kid, pay all their fees for a whole year. And we, we like, I don't know, if I, I shouldn't say we, but man, I can spend 75 bucks on lunch. Um, if I take enough people, um, you know what I mean? Like, it's like nothing, but a kid's whole life going to school or not going to school changes everything. So I don't know, Vanessa and I are twisting around our head, like, you know, how can we maybe get some, a bunch of churches or people to get their friends together and say, we'll each give $75 once a year, um, it's just like the scale is what's overwhelming. Already we've identified over 100 children who are in leprosy-afflicted families who need help. But, I mean, literally thousands and thousands. So, you know, you just praise the Lord. Like, you, you just do what God enables you to do. But it was a fantastic um, trip. And I, I know something very well. As soon as God gives you a great victory and a great harvest, the enemy comes after you. And like we got home on Thursday and I went to bed Friday night and then again last night just with a broken heart. And I was like, man, the devil is a crafty, you know, bleep. Because if he can't get you, he goes after what you love. And um, most of you know that through some experience, but I, I have determined I'm, nothing is going to distract me f from my king or his kingdom. So, anyway, thank you guys for everybody who's helped us uh, do all these projects. Very grateful. And, um, you know, I really do appreciate it. It makes, it makes a difference. So... Um, I really appreciated Pastor Richie's uh, message. I thought, wow, timely. Boy, he's brave. You know, I say things that, man, he, he gave it to you. You know, you ever heard that thing like, oh, Pastor, you really gave it to him today. You really gave it to him today. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I meant to give it to you, <laughs> but I'm glad I gave it to them. And then last week when Pastor Brian came, um, I, I wasn't able to watch it because we didn't have a Wi-Fi signal where we were, but I watched it a couple days later, and I sent him a text, and I said, wow, where did you get that? That was just what we needed. And he goes, man, I don't, I don't know. God just gave me that message. So i um, very grateful for that. But we're back in Galatians chapter number two. And the first two chapters of Galatians is Paul's kind of laying it out, man. I have apostolic authority, and these people who are coming in behind me, they're the deceivers. And you got to open your eyes and be aware. And uh, he, he, he tells us very clearly, my way of saying it is, it's Jesus plus nothing. And that's everything. And once you start to add just even a little bit here and a little bit there to Jesus and his finished work, it's not good news. And so uh, the last time we were talking about, we had to get free from the law because the law is what kept us in sin. Now, remember, the law wasn't the problem. The law identified the problem. But as long as we live under a law system, a system of performing to gain, we're going to become, we're going to remain slaves to sin. And so he said, man, you needed to be liberated from the law so that you could live unto God. 
Now, I know religious people have a hard time with this one because they think, well, I got to have the law so I can live for God. But I want you to understand there's something different than living for God, but living unto God and from God. See, one we do through self-effort and our own performance, which is just going to leave you exhausted, frustrated, and a lack of peace. Because it's all depending on you and what you can do, what you can do for him, but you don't have that ability. And so he liberates you from the law so that as he lives in us, he can live through us. That it's not my life and my effort, but him expressing his life through me. We all, in some way or other, have tried with all of our energy and determination to change something, have we not? I know that on January 1st, Vanessa and I took off. I, I don't know what kind of New Year's resolutions you made. I don't. I really don't. I know that by now you have failed because it's already been more than two weeks. When I was going to Planet Fitness, I always hated January. The first three weeks of January at Planet Fitness, you couldn't even get in. But by February, it was fine. Why? Because you and I make a commitment. We determine that we are going to change things and make it happen. We are going to make ourselves better people. I know I can improve. Man, that reminds me of that scene in The Godfather. I can be a better man. But in the end, by Godfather 3, he was still a mess. Why? Because he was trying to be the source. You see what I'm saying? Like if we think that we're the agency to improve ourselves or get better, what we do one of two things. We either quit because we see ourselves as absolute failures or we go to church and pretend like we're really good people and judge everyone else. One is honest with themselves, one's delusional. He's saying, no, it's not you, it's Christ in you. So, Verse 20 and 21, I know, two whole verses, but yeah, you got to get through it. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Father, I'm really excited about expressing this, but I want you to speak through me into the hearts of your people because I need them to have revelation and understanding. And, then, and that doesn't come from the eloquence of some man's mouth or words. It comes from a divine working of your spirit. And that's what I'm pleading for, that you would open eyes that you would make the way, that you would give clarity. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to break it down, right? He said, I, I've set you free from the law so that you can live under Christ. And then he goes, I have been crucified with Christ. I remember, you know, over the years when when we were doing missions full-time, you know, I'd be going to churches and preaching all the time, and one of the worst things that could happen to a missionary is when you go to a church and they start asking questions. You're like, oh, my gosh, what are they going to ask me? Well, this girl gets up, and she goes, can you tell me how to live the Christian life? And I was like, no. No, I've been trying it for the last 10 years. It hasn't worked out too good for me. Because I was just beginning to understand the new covenant, that it wasn't me living for him or doing things for him, but from him. And all of my self-effort and all of my, my works and my, my, my well intentions and my determination, you know, my intestinal fortitude. Someone told me that one. You have intestinal fortitude. I said, I got a lot of things in my intestines and I don't know what all it is, but... It ain't good. I mean, I don't, I don't know what that is. After living in the jungle, you know, you just got things in your intestines. You don't know, like, but fortitude, I don't know. 
I mean, so I'm sitting there and I'm struggling. I'm like, listen, no, I can't tell you how to live the Christian life. I can tell you how to live the tin life. Don't recommend it. Only Christ can live the Christ life. Larry can live the Larry life. But only Christ can live the Christian life. As soon as you and I grab a hold of this truth, then we cease our self, our striving through self-effort. And the moment that we step aside from striving to gain something, striving to achieve something, then we're at peace. Then we can rest. Then we can abide. But as long as we're striving, we never have done enough. As long as I endeavor to live his life, I'm destined to life of frustration and failure. So when Christ died, the sinful, uh, the, the old man, the King James said, the sinful self was put to death. Paul states that, that his relationship to the law had to end because he was crucified with Christ. And I was teasing a few weeks ago about this whole thing that if you commit a crime and they capture you and they throw you in jail and you die of a heart attack, even though you had a 50-year sentence, they don't leave you there for 50 years, do they? Even if you commit the crime and then you're running and have a heart attack, they don't take you to jail. They call the morgue. Why? Because as soon as you're dead, the law loses its authority over you. So here's what Paul's trying to bring together for us is to show us is the law was perfect. There was nothing wrong with the law. But you had some really big issues and you needed to die because all the law could do for you was say guilty. Amen, pastor, that's good. Yeah. But is it not true? Does anyone want to like stand up and give a testimony of how your life has been absolutely perfect and without any flaw or failure? Man, you're going to go to the pearly gates and stand before Peter and say, you know, let me in because I'm perfect. There is medication that can help you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're, we all know in some way that we've all sinned. We've all failed. There's all a price that we cannot pay. There's nothing we can do to make up for it. So he killed us. So he takes us, when we entrust ourselves to him, he takes us into himself. He takes the immaterial part of who we are and he takes us into himself and it's nailed to the cross. And after he declares, it is finished, he takes us into the grave. And on the third day, he rises again. And who's with him? We are. And on the 40th day, he ascends up into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. And who's there? We are. Now, we have this problem because we live in time. So some of you analysts, you thinkers, you're saying, well, wait a second. Uh, I, uh, he went to the cross 2,000 years ago, and I was just born, you know, back then, uh, yeah, 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 it doesn't fit the timeline. But see, this is the thing. It's the thing that makes it eternal is that there is no time. And he lives outside of time, and so he knows all things. And he, he took us into himself, knowing that when we entrust himself, we would have the experience that our sins are nailed to the cross. But not only were our sins nailed to the cross, we were nailed to the cross. Why? Because we needed to die. Because the only way we could get free from the law, the only way that we could get free from what we were as sinners was to be born again. That's what, when John says, listen, you must be born again, he's speaking to a very religious person. 
And there he was trying to figure it out. Like, uh, you know, how do you crawl back in there? And, I, you know, it doesn't make sense. But he wasn't talking about the physical, because the physical part, the earth suit, this thing, it's, you know, it's dust. It don't matter how much makeup you put on it. We're all going back to dust. I mean, whether, you know, you, you, you're, you're, we're just temporary earth suits. That's not, but that's not who we are. We're spirit beings who have a soul, and we live in a body, and when that body gives out, that's not the end. Just the end of that body. When we go to a funeral service, I mean, if you're atheistic, you might say, well, you know, like, uh, that's the end of it. But as believers, we don't go to a funeral service to say, that's the end of it. We're saying, hey, until we meet again. Because we know that death is not the end of existence. Death is a change in relationship. So I was crucified with Christ because I needed it. Because it's the only way that I could get free, set free from my self-effort. The only way I could get free from who I was in Adam as a sinner was to go to the cross. And a dead man is no longer under the law. Colossians 3.3 3 says, for you have died. You have died. You're like, no, I haven't. Yes, you have. The moment you believed and entered into eternal life, you died to everything you were in Adam. We all can consent in some form or another that we've all sinned. We are all sinned because we were sinners. True? Do you have to teach any of your kids? I mean, do you have to go and teach your kids how to sin? It's a weird thing. Like, Shella's raising a little girl, and she's as cute as can be. And you should see these pictures of her walking. It's amazing. So cute. Adorable. Unbelievable. But here's the shocker. That kid will know how to sin before she knows how to talk. And Shella will spend the rest of her life trying to train her in the way of the Lord. Until the point where she can say, you know what, I trust Jesus. I needed to be born again. And her spirit comes alive to God. The same thing is true for all. We all needed it. And he says, you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So when we entrust ourselves to Jesus, we put our faith in him and what he did. The scripture tells us he came and he lives in us and we live in him. And there's this beautiful exchange. I give up everything I was in Adam to receive all that I will ever need in the last Adam, which is Jesus. To die with him is not a, uh, not a physical death, but all that we were in our spirit. Romans 6, 6 kind of puts it the same thing this way. He says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You know, I love it because the world has totally perverted all of it. They go, man, I'm free to do whatever I want. Right? I'm free to do this and I'm free to do that. And I'm listening, they're going, You think you're free, but you're a slave. Because the end consequence of sin is death. The end consequence of sin is always guilt, condemnation, and shame. And you're you're saying, I'm free to sin, but what you're not realizing is you have a master who's running your life over the cliff into destruction. He says, listen, you needed to die so you could have a new master. So that you could be under one new master who has only your good interest in mind. He said, you are hidden in him. I love it. 
Because when I take myself apart from this relationship and this unity that I have in him, I'm a mess. You know, and sometimes people like to share with you what a you know, what an idiot you are, and tell you all your flaws, and I'm like, yeah, it, 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 there's probably plenty of uh, evidence of, of all that you say. But the good news is I'm hidden in Christ, and Christ lives in me. Vanessa and I were having this conversation on our trip one night, and you know, she was talking about her feelings, and me being this super sensitive you know, man that I am. I said, well, let's talk about feelings because, you know, feelings are important. And, <laughs> well, she's going to hit me later, but it's okay. I kind of like it. Um, <laughs> she says, well, they made me feel. And see, what I was trying to convey is that we say that. Right? We say, they made me feel, they made me do, they made me act, they made me respond, they, and I'm like, why have we allowed ourselves, why are we empowering the wrong masters? Now, it doesn't invalidate that you have feelings and that those feelings are important. It's just saying, listen, I don't want to empower anyone to make me do anything because I only have one master. And really, in the end, there's only one person's opinion that matters. And he says, I love you, and you're mine, and you're accepted, and you're righteous, and in me you have everything you will ever need totally accepted. Do you see the difference? Because if I let someone else be my master, Christ isn't. And he goes, I, I had you hidden in me. I had your old self crucified so that you would no longer be a slave to the body of sin. Sin can't make you do anything. Sin is in you, but it's not you. See, here's the struggle, right? Because we like to do this. So, anybody here ever tell a lie? Okay, well, let's just assume. Like, we know that there are people out there that they told a lie. None of us, but because we're delusional. But uh, you told a lie, and what do we say? You are a definitely. And that person stole. Uh, so we say they are a, that person killed that person. They are a, and so what have we done? We've uh, tied behavior to identity. We say what you do defines who you are. Okay. So, um, could someone tell me what sound a cow makes? Come on, someone help me out here. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Was it mm, or whatever, right? Now, think about this. Think about this. Did that make you guys cows? It made you a little weird that you would actually make a cow noise just because I suggested it. I got a point there, don't I? See, you mooing doesn't make you a cow, even if it is strange. Are you following me? And what I'm trying to get you to see is if you sinned, it doesn't make you a sinner because you didn't become a sinner by sinning. You were born that way. And the reason we all need to have a born-again experience in which we entrust ourselves to Christ is that's the only way we can be made a saint. And we don't become saints by doing saintly things. Now, a saint can still sin, but it's just kind of like you guys making the cow noise. It's just freaky. 
But if you believe the wrong thing and you believe all I am is a sinner, how are you ever going to get free from sin? Because you will always act out what you believe to be true of yourself. And Paul's saying, yeah, you sinned and you sinned. I mean, you did a really good job. But that's why you died. You died and you were hidden in him so that that old thing, the body of sin, can be brought it says to nothing, but it really means to be rendered ineffective or powerless. So yeah, you're going to be tempted, but temptation isn't sin. Yeah, the enemy's going to come and he's going to tell you lies and he almost always uses some kind of human voice to give you a message and you take that message and, he's, and you can act on it and be saying, no, that doesn't define you. Who are you? You're a saint. How do you become a saint? By entrusting yourselves to Christ and knowing that he came by his perfect sacrifice to sanctify your spirit so that he could live in you and you would be able to live in him who is perfectly holy. That's nothing you can do on your own. It's something he does to you and for you. He died for my atonement, my atonement, he paid that price, but I needed to die to be free from my identity as a sinner. And there was no other way. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. It doesn't mean we don't have some bad habits or bad thoughts or bad actions still. But you got to believe you are what he says you are so that you can experience the transformation. He sanctifies us. He declares it to be true. And then he says, now will you release yourself to me so that as I live through you, you can experience the fullness of your sanctification. But if you try to do it, you're just going to be religious and exhausted and afraid to be transparent. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So Paul's saying, listen, the, en the end has come for self-sufficiency. The end has come uh, for performing. The end has come. And now there's a beautiful exchange because you no longer live but Christ lives in you. Christ in you is the source. Christ in you is everything you're ever going to need. So think of it like this. There's two sides of the cross. On one side of that, we see the cross, and we see Jesus going there and becoming sin for us, him who knew no sin. And there he is, and he's taking it all in, all of our suffering. And there he is, and he gives. And he says, it's finished. And he took us into himself and we died. We were buried. We rose again. And we're forgiven. But see, if that's the end of the story, what are we? Forgiven corpses. Are you hearing me? Forgiven corpses. What does a dead person need more than anything else? You see, because we, we, we live under the illusion that we're alive because we have physical life, even if we're spiritually dead. But he's saying, no, I have something much more important than physical life. I have spiritual life, eternal life, a quality of life that's Christ in you and you in him. So I no longer live. I'm no longer living a self-driven, self-directed life. Christ lives in me, and my part is simply to receive and be responsive to what he wants to do in and through me. I'm not doing any of it to gain his favor. I'm not doing any of it to be righteous. I'm not doing any of it to be accepted. I'm not doing any of it to be loved. The, the whole mission of our lives and the things we do, we, do, we don't do that to gain God's favor. We do it because we have his favor. We don't do it to get blessings, like somehow I can manipulate God into doing something that I want him to do. No, forget that nonsense. I'm blessed. And I have the great privilege of being a blessing to others because I'm blessed. 
It's not me. It's Christ in me. It's not you. It's Christ in you. And as soon as you're willing to come to this place where you realize your identity has been secured and that the other side of the cross is your resurrection power, you're stuck in self-effort. You have to believe. You have to know. In Colossians 127, he says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know why you have hope? Because Christ is in you. If you're left to your own resources, this is a desperate world. I'm serious. If you think, man, here I am and I got to try and pull this off, I mean, man, you're going to have to up the antidepressants because this is a depressing place. You know why I have hope? Because Christ is in me. That's what gives me hope. That he could take me who was his enemies and a sinner and put his life in me and say, listen, all of your efforts are done. Your striving is done. You're seeking acceptance and approval and love from where no one can give you what you need. And you have it all in me. So you're going to say, well, pastor, okay, 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 but, but. But, but, if Christ is in me and I died, why do I still sin? Remember, sin didn't cease to exist. Death isn't the cessation of existence. Death is a change of relationship. Now notice he says, you got to know this. You got to know that Christ is in you. You got to know that He's your source. You got to know that you have everything you will ever need in Him. Because if you don't, you won't experience it. And it'll always be true. You see what I'm saying? I was working with a group of pastors when we were in Sri Lanka, and, and they were saying something, and it just, you know, I had this trigger. I said, don't do that. And they go, what? I said, don't ask God for more favor, more, what were they saying in English, more anointing. I said, quit that. Quit asking God to give you everything you already have. Thank him that in Christ you have anointing. And when you know you have anointing, when you know that he is your source, when you know that his resurrection power is the very power of life in you, well, then you can start living out of it because you know it's true. But if you're just going to church every Sunday and getting the message, you're just no good sinners, well, don't expect your life to be free from sin. What I'm trying to get you to hear is, you're not a sinner. I know. Sometimes you act like it. Sometimes you talk like it. Sometimes you feel like it. But it isn't who you are. You have a new identity that is fixed. Sin is in you, but it's not you. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In what? Oh, that was pathetic. I live by faith in? Ah, isn't that good news? Now, if, if we said, if Esther said, like, I live by faith in Esther, I'd be like, ooh, that's a problem. Esther's a wonderful person. She's a teacher, Brad told you. But she's also a flight attendant. And those are scary people. Take teacher, flight attendant. I mean, that's one angry woman all put together. I'm just kidding. Esther's not like that at all. 
You see what I'm saying? Do you understand why this is so important? See, I don't have faith in Tim Ekno. I mean, I have people say, to me, well, don't you trust yourself? I'm saying, hell no, I don't trust me. Don't put your trust in me. Man, I will do nothing but disappoint you. Put your trust, put your faith in Jesus. Because it's only by faith that we please him. Thinking that we're going to do something for him does not please him. Knowing that he is everything and will do all that he desires in and through us, faith in him, a gift that we receive, that pleases him. And we can seek to do only that which pleases him because he made us pleasing. Because now all of a sudden doing what pleases him is the only natural thing. And any other action or attitude that's contrary to that, you just say, wow, that was freaky. It was as freaky as a cat barking or a dog meowing or you making cow noises in church. I mean, it's just weird. See, all of a sudden, now I'm not saying sin. Oh, that's who I am because I always do that. Now I'm saying, that was some pretty freaky stuff right there. Lord, that isn't who you made me to be. And I thank you for forgiving me. And Lord, whatever triggered that, I pray that you would reveal it so that I can enter into a deeper fulfillment, uh, fulfilling of your, of your transforming work in me. Faith makes us pleasing to him when we trust what he did. He's pleased. It's a beautiful thing. Romans 6.11 says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin. Doesn't mean you don't exist. Doesn't mean sin doesn't exist. What does it mean? That you have a new relationship to sin. And sin is a foreign actor. It's not who you are. Can you lie? Yes, but you'll never be a liar again. You'll be a saint who told a lie. Could you steal? Yeah. But you'd never be a thief. You'd be a saint who stole, and there's consequences. He said, listen, I want you to consider yourselves dead. I want you to reconcile your spiritual account. Does anybody but me reconcile their checking account? Esther, okay, there's like three of us. I don't get it. Maybe it's my nerdy finance background, but like, you know, this is the basics. You got to know what's going in. You got to know what's going out. You got to make sure everything's there. You got, you know, you got to reconcile. So you know where you stand. Well, I, I remember my oldest son, Ryan, he came to the U.S., and we're still living in Vietnam, and he got a checking account, and he got a debit card. It was wonderful for him, right? Except for every couple of weeks, he's writing me saying, Dad, send me money. I'm like, why? He goes, man, I got this $60 overdraft fee. I go, overdraft? How in the world did you get an overdraft? He goes, I don't know. I just put the card in. If it lets me buy something, I got it. I, I'm son, are you not reconciling your account? No. Well, you better start. Christians, here's where you go wrong. You go through life and you say, man, I got my ticket to heaven. And uh, yeah, let's hope for the best but you got to wake up every morning and reconcile your account. you got to wake up and say, you know what? I was a sinner, and I did a fine job sinning, but I am no longer a sinner. I am a new creature in Christ. And Christ lives in me, and he's the source, and I'm not. Lord, here I am. What do you want to do today? Where do you want to go? What do you want to say how do you want to give? Let's go. If you don't reconcile your account and say, you know what? I'm the beloved child of God, 
that I'm wholly righteous because of what he did. I'm accepted. I'm complete. I have everything I will ever... If you don't reconcile the account, the world's going to tell you a whole different message. I talked to you a couple weeks ago. What's on your playlist? What is you playing around in your head? Am I the only one who has these conversations in my head that nobody knows about? I had a dream the other night. It was bad. And I woke up mad. I can't remember what my wife had done in this dream, but it was bad. And I had just cause to be mad. And then I wake up, and a few minutes into it, I mean, I feel mad. And I'm like, none of that was true. But if I had let that playlist keep playing, I would have lived, I would walk, I've gone through the whole day mad. You see, if you don't reconcile your account and make sure that your playlist is telling you the truth, you'll forget. Because the world's going to be out there where the enemy is going to be saying all kinds of things. You own it and you're going to say, I'm not good enough. I'm not accepted. I'm a liar. I'm a failure. I'm no good. Yada, yada, yada. And then you begin to live out what you believe to be true of yourself, and it's all a lie. The playlist has to affirm what God declares to be true. And you have to be intentional about what you put on your playlist. This morning I was coming to church and been struggling with some things and this song from Mercy Me came on. It's on my playlist. And it's called Even If. You know, there's times when even as a pastor, I, I'm excited to teach and preach. I am. I really love it. But there's sometimes I just want to play hooky because I don't feel it. I'm hurt. And that song was on my playlist. It was the first song on my playlist when I got in the car. And it says, even if. It goes like night after night. You know, like, it goes, and it ends with, but you're faithful. You're faithful. And I was like, okay, man, you know, it's not about me being sufficient. Because Christ is my sufficiency. And he's yours. We consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ because that's the only way we can continue. He says, well, who loved me and gave himself for me. How do you ever get over the fact that you and I are just miserable and wretched messes? And he said, wow, I love that one. I love you. And he gave himself for us. See, we live in a world that says, I love you, and this is what you need to give me. And God says, I love you, and I give myself for you. It's, every parent knows this kind of a thing, right? It's been a long time since we had babies, and Vanessa still gets to hold them. We were, she was holding them. Muslim lady brings this baby and says, I want, to, I want you to hold my baby, you know? And babies are awesome. But man, they do nasty things to you. They do disgusting, vile things. But you love them. And you just keep cleaning them up and loving them. And if you, as messed up as you are, can love your child like that, think about the way God loves you. You might say, well, God couldn't love me after that. He cleans you up, and he cuddles you. He says, I love you. He says, I do not nullify the grace of God. We're way to end this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet. Not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live day by day, I live by faith in him who's my perfect performance. And I can trust him to do all that he wants. I live by faith in the Son who loved me and gave himself for me. And by the way, 
Don't set aside the grace of God. We know because we were all born sinners that there was no way for us to have life apart from grace. We're saved by grace through faith and there's no other way. But don't you buy the enemy's lie that's told in church that you get saved by grace and you get sanctified by self-effort. Paul says the way you got saved by grace is the way you live day by day in his perfect sufficiency. The best you can do on your own is to become a Pharisee. You can do the fake it till you make it if you want, but I don't want to fake it. He's everything. Don't declare it invalid. Don't frustrate the grace of God by living, in your, living your life in your own power and trying to do something for him. You can't live the Christian life. Quit trying. Let Christ in you live his life through you. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So I don't get it. Like, what happened to people in America and the Western world where they're, where they're always preaching people to get right after they've been made right? If righteousness came through self-effort, there was no reason for Jesus to die. But righteousness is a gift that we receive. He made us righteous by his perfect sacrifice. And I receive it. And I confess it's grace. It was the grace the day I was born again. It was grace the next day. And I had to rediscover it after years of trying to live for God. Because I tried. I lived for God. Drove everybody crazy. Wore myself out. I don't live for God now. I live from him. And unto him. And then there's peace. There's acceptance. Because it's not about me. It's all about him. Jesus plus nothing always equals everything. And once you start to add even the smallest little thing, you nullify, you set aside his grace. Okay, so the believer has been crucified in Christ. Not everybody is in Christ, but Christ's work is completely sufficient for all mankind. You're here today, you're watching online, you hear this in the future. If you don't know that you're in Christ, would you just say, Lord Jesus, here I come, a mess, a sinner. And I trust what you did on that cross to be the perfect sacrifice for my sins. I entrust myself to you. I give myself to you and I receive you to be life itself, forgiveness, righteousness, sanctification, everything. And at that moment, the old you died. The new you, the new creature is Christ in you. I needed to die. You needed to die. We all needed to die because we couldn't change our stripes. But he's the one who transforms us from sinner to saint. So that he could live in us. So that he could live through us. You can't add any self-effort to the cross without making it bad news. Father, would you transform our whole experience?
Will you show us how to set up the playlist in our minds and our thinking that affirms what we know is true in you? That we're the holy, beloved children of God, saints, complete, accepted, righteous, holy, beloved. And out of all that, we know that as we live in you and you live in us, you are our complete sufficiency. And so we quit trying right now, today. And we let you do all that you desire as surrendered vessels. Amen. Hey, will you all stand up, and I'm going to pray a blessing on you and let you go home. It's 12.04, man. I just went a little long. You know, I got a little excited there. Um, Father, our hands are outstretched because we know it's faith in you that pleases you. And so we give up trying and self-effort, and we just say, Lord, here we are, your children, saints who have trusted you and your finished work, and we know that you live in us, and we live in you. So live through us. And Lord, when there's some kind of temptation or action or attitude that doesn't fit who you've made us to be, let us be quick to acknowledge it and call it what it is, freaky, strange, unbefitting. Always living out of your divine life. And we give you praise. Amen. Hey, I love you. Have a great week.